chapter of the Gospel of John. I struggle with sermons like these. And the biggest struggle is, like, how do you make something, how do you communicate a truth like this? <laughs> How do you communicate a truth like this and really do it justice? Well, I can't do that. I need the Holy Spirit to help me do that. <clears throat> in our series leading up to Christmas, um, one of the things the Lord laid on my heart, in order to appreciate the incarnation, Christ being made a baby, we should be able to, we need to understand in most of you, I'm sure, do understand, but maybe just need a reminder, maybe a refocus that our God is the God of all creation. He's the God of all creation. I hope this is encouragement to you. It was to me as I was preparing it. Wonderful text in John chapter 1. Let me turn there myself. Beginning at verse 1. Reading from the New King James Version. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. <coughs> he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth. In one of John's epistles over, over back here in 1 John, close to Revelation, back in the Bible, he kind of mentioned this again, not so many words. He said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands and handled, concerning the word of life. The life is manifested and we've seen and bear witness. Declare to you, that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by Him, and we're talking about Jesus here, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the God of all creation. I'm glad that we're not a liberal church. Can I say that out loud? <laughs> that makes reading the Bible a whole lot more fun. <laughs> That means I can believe every single word of it. And I do believe every single word of it. It really wouldn't matter if I believed it or not. So we can continue to talk about Jesus turning all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Because we embrace that here. Not that we want to carry a <laughs> wave that flag, but really you got to in these days. There's a lot of people that are trying to take this away from Jesus. They're trying to take this part away from God. That's really where the biggest fight is being waged right now in the secular world is trying to take creation away from God. Because 
If you take creation away from God, you take the standards away from God. You take the foundation of the Bible away from God. It helps you to pick and choose whatever you want to believe in the Bible. And uh, some people would say this is poetry. It's pretty obvious that it's history. <laughs> Let's look at chapter 1 and verse 14. This is an interesting thing. I just want to look at a couple of things about creation tonight. Then God said, chapter 1, verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament, firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so <coughs> then God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also <laughs> God said set them in the firmament, firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw it was good so the evening and the morning was the fourth day. He did all that in one day. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Cool. All I'm doing is read the scripture. And Jesus is like, Amen. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Little sentence that you might look over there. He made the stars also. <laughs> isn't the scripture awesome? <laughs> what do we know about stars today? I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing. I am not a scientist. I'm never going to claim to be. My life will tell you that. I'm not smart enough to be a scientist. But I can sit and think about some of this stuff and kind of share some of my thoughts with you. Now, our brother Simon, I was kind of banking on him being here tonight. I want to throw Papa New Guinea in here a little bit and, and help him to smile. But we know, we know Simon, and we've all kind of went over there and looked at that map, and he's from a little island above Australia, you know, Papa New Guinea. Papa New Guinea is 8,765 miles from Jackson, Kentucky. 8,765 miles. That would be like driving to Lexington and back about 110 times. <laughs> to go to Papua New Guinea. Now, to the moon from here, from Jackson, Kentucky, if we were going to hop in our car and drive to the moon, it would be like, well, not in a car, but it would be like a plane, you know. It would be like flying a plane 27 times or traveling completely around the globe 10 times the distance from here to the moon, let alone Papua New Guinea, which is awesome enough, just something to mention here in Scripture that God created, but that, is, that pales in comparison to our sun. Our sun is 93 million miles away right now. And I don't think it's going to get any closer. I hope it doesn't get any closer or farther away. But it's 93 million miles away. If we reduced our sun's distance by a mere 5%, we would be destroyed. It's perfectly placed where it needs to be in order for life to be on this planet. And if it was just 1% further away from us, our oceans would freeze. Just 1%, which would destroy life as we know it anyway. Our sun is so large that you could fit one million of our earths within it. Think about that. One million of the earths inside our sun. And our sun per second lets off the equivalent of six trillion 126 billion, 984 million, 126,984 nuclear bombs that we dropped on Japan. Don't ask me to repeat that number. I'm glad I got through the first time. <laughs> of course, we've got nuclear bombs that are much more powerful than that now. But that's what our sun does in one second. Can anybody name a superstar? Anybody says Lady Gaga, I'm going to excommunication. That's for your starting 
Yep, it is. But the biggest star that we know of, and Mr. Nelson, sitting here in front of him, teaches Creation Science at our college, so if I'm saying this wrong, correct me. Canis Majoris. Is that it? Hmm? Big dog star. Big dog star. Is about 1,800 to 2,100 times the circumference of our sun. He made the stars also, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing scripture? He made the stars also. It was almost, it's, it's almost like, I wouldn't dare say this, just kind of out of just half joking, but Moses just writing this and like the Holy Spirit just mentioned it to him. By the way, he made the rest of the stars too. Right? He made the stars also. <laughs> and then when you really, I mean, sometimes you just wonder. Sometimes you just wonder. If the Lord just allows us to figure these things out, just so, you know, when people reject him, they're going to be brought in front of him one day. When their knees are bowed, he's going to be like, by the way, the sun was 92 million miles away, not 93. Some of these scientists that think they've got everything figured out. And, I, and you know what? I've got their books up there. I can't say that I've read them all or anything, but I've, I've glanced through books and I've been in secular college and things, and, and people just really don't have this stuff figured out. They really don't. The best they can do is make educated guesses, which is what a hypothesis is. That's really the best they can do. And then Stephen Hawking would have the audacity, which was supposedly one of the smartest men in the world, to say not too long ago, it was probably 20 years ago now, that philosophy is dead. But yet, he can philosophize all day about how old the solar system is, and he's changed his ideas I don't know how many times. But that's what we have with science today. But we have a God who, by the way, made the stars also. <laughs> He made the stars also. It's almost an afterthought. You know, another another one of my favorite verses. Psalm chapter 33. You ought to turn there because it's a quick one, but it's a good one to good one just to throw up on social media or something like that every once in a while. Just to make the atheist sound. <laughs> Psalm 33 verse 6 simply says by the word of the Lord the heavens are made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth my goodness by the breath of his mouth now here's what I'm really trying to do tonight is sometimes people tend in their mind to separate God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit and they think of like distinctive qualities and they would never think of Jesus as somebody who has spoke the Son into existence. But when we realize that it's the same Jesus who died on the cross for our sins in which the Son rolled out of his mouth, it ties some ends together. Should motivate our prayer life. Should be able to put our heart upon God for bigger things, shouldn't it? I believe if he's a God that has created our son, if he's a God who has created Canis Majoris, I believe he's also a God that can create a clean and pure heart in me. I think he's also a God who can create an act of salvation in our lost loved ones. He's also a God who can create a revival right here in Jackson, Kentucky. It should encourage our faith to believe that. Because our God is a mighty creator. What's amazing to me is that's just tipping the iceberg in nature. I mean, when you start looking into science, and I would challenge you to do that. Christians ought to do that. Christians ought to look into science and see what they're discovering as long as we realize that we have a creator. Those sort of things are really interesting to me. It's amazing to me to learn how a giraffe works. You know, giraffe is being used today as... You know, great evidence of creation. There's no way something like that could evolve. Something that has to do with the way it breathes, the way it drinks, the way it eats, and all those things, it would be impossible if its neck was any shorter or anything. I mean, there's just so many little things like that that you can you can look to. You know, I, when I think of God as a creator, the, we're talking about a big creation. I also think of things sometimes, I'm sorry if this freaks anybody out, but I also think about, you know, 
If evolution was true, why on earth would we have something like a spider? Can you think of how that thing could have come into existence? Something that could make a can spin web and silk out, out of its back end to catch bugs. And how on earth does something like that come into existence? I've never seen a special on it. I've never watched a video on it. I've never read a book on it. But I've observed the spider web before and just sat there and thought about my God as a creator. I'd say, this is pretty remarkable, actually. This thing can engineer this without even a brain, really. It can sit there and engineer that. What about a bumblebee fly? Scientists yeah. say that it's impossible. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, how on earth? A hummingbird. How on earth? <laughs> you know, God's in these little things. And I invite discussion in this because it, it is something we ought to be celebrating. It's something we ought to be celebrating. Our God is a mighty creator. We ought to be appreciating his creation. Every one of us ought to be hiking more. We'll just be out there hiking around, just looking around and thinking. <laughs> I didn't hear any amens, but hey, we'll go. If y'all want to, I know some small crowds, we can go look around. But we ought to be able to appreciate our God and creation. You know, a snowflake, as much as we take that for granted, I would challenge you, go home and look up a picture of a snowflake under a microscope. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Something that small has so much detail and so much... I mean, those two snowflakes are alike. I think that's how it goes, but they all kind of look similar. They, all, they have a design to it. Now, how can those things come into, come into creation by accident? How can they? <clears throat> you know, something else we ought to appreciate and take for granted, especially in eastern Kentucky, we take it for granted all the time. Huh? Kudzu. Oh, we we'll definitely take kudzu for granted. <laughs> <laughs> that hairy little thing. That's a, that's a product of the fall. That's not creation. Do <laughs> you know something about kudzu, Jim? It's pretty interesting. Well, I know that, that uh, cows like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could feed the cows and they'd eat it. it would, they'd be waiting for something else and then last resort. It's really palatable, except you just can't control it. So it, you don't want to plant it. It's really why the United States bombed Japan. <laughs> and the goat <laughs> will get rid of it. So, we got North Carolina too because that's where they brought it into. Was oh, really? Thanks to the Outer Banks. <laughs> the goat will get rid of it. Yeah, you're right. Goats will take care of those things. Goats love it. They'll lead you right down to the roof. Anyway, we're getting way off topic here. One thing <laughs> that we ought to appreciate. <laughs> I'm <make> you too. <laughs> one thing we ought to appreciate is our own body. Genesis chapter 1 26. So then God said, and by the way, this is just a side here. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There's people out here today that doesn't believe that there's a trinity. Doesn't believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you can see pretty clearly right there, there they are. <laughs> Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every little thing that moves on the earth. Amazing uh, to me. Amazing to me is our body. They say if all the DNA in your body was uncoiled, it would stretch out to be about 10 billion miles long which is the distance from Earth to Pluto and back. <laughs> By the way, just one strand of DNA in your body. If there, there are a trillion nerves powering just your memory, so if any of you are starting to lose your memory, know that you, might have, you may have lost a couple of million, but there's still millions going. So, 
read a book, they might come back or something. Studies have shown that after viewing 2,500 images for only three seconds, participants could recall if they had seen the images with 92% accuracy. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Your eyes can distinguish between 2.3 and 7.5 million different colors. That's amazing. Your nose can differentiate between one trillion different smells. And there are 37 trillion cells in your body. And just as a side note, your stomach acid can dissolve metal. Wow. It's some pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? And you don't think about that because we never take the time to really look this stuff up. I'm guilty for it too, you know? It's an amazing thing. Uh, Yes, Dustin. Well, on a science on a science note, everything on this earth that is created uh, is based off of 100 percent of the periodic table, except for the human body. It's only created of 97.3 percent. What created? What's the other? Uh, what is it? Uh, 20, 26 percent or so. You got to have room for the spirit. 2.4. I don't know. You got to have room for the spirit. It's under nine. <laughs> Another thing about the sun, like every four to five days, we get a new outer, layer, um, outer, um, yeah, cover for your stomach, the uh, lining, lining you know, mm -hmm. of your stomach. Yep, the inner lining of your stomach changes every four days. I also right. saw on this list that I took these facts from that you completely shed your skin about every four days. Dead skin cell. I mean, and that's a product of the fall, <laughs> right there. Um, I would say some of the stomach acid. I, I would guess. You know, but if you, I mean, when you think about these things, you would think, yeah, it makes sense that we were made in the image of God. I mean, the best cats can do is shout all the place. You need to sleep <laughs> in the bathroom, you know. <laughs> but we are made in the image of God. And because we're made in the image of God, we're also given a mind to reason. We're given a mind to think for ourselves. We're given a mind to be able to study and to be able to, you know, comprehend things that an animal cannot. And I just don't see how it even be reasonable that any of this stuff could just happen by chance. <laughs> I can't see how it'd be reasonable at all. But you know, the most amazing fact to me, if we could turn back to John, Chapter 1. Just like the reread the verse. It's when you're thinking about all that, and before we go here, keep in mind that we're a product of the fall. We're a product of, you know, we are, our bodies are still this amazing after sin entered the world. Our bodies are still dying. I mean, we are not the original creation of the Garden of Eden. They were made perfect in God's image. I could not imagine what their bodies would have been like without any death ever touching, without any sickness, without any disease, without, without anything that would hinder us. Our bodies are fallen. Even Jesus' body was fallen. He took on mortal flesh. Chapter 1, verse 14. I said all that to say this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Now think about that in context with everything that I just said. That's why I wanted to kind of keep it brief. Here's the God who brought out, breathed out stars that could destroy one star. It, it, I mean, if it even just passed close to our solar system, it would wipe out everything, including our star. Who fine tooled the universe, who, who, who made the stars, okay? The God who created everything in our body, who created our eyes, our hands, our nervous system, our memories, and all those amazing things. That God went through the same process that we all did in our mother's womb. First time I ever made that connection as a Christian was probably about four or five years ago. And I just had to sit there for a minute and just, I mean, I almost cried. And I said to sit there and think about that just for a moment and say, wow, how on earth? I can tell you this, there is no God 
in any religion. And I've studied some of them to try to prove this wrong. There's no God in any religion that comes close to that, that comes near that, that touches that. Go ahead. I'm encouraging you. I look around the room. There's some, there's some smart people in here. Go home and study that. Look up all. Look up one of the millions of Hindu gods. Try to find one. You're, you're not going to. Not ever in history. A god that chose to humble himself that much. It's powerful to me. It's powerful to me. What religion has a god other than ours that has a god that died and came back to life? Yeah, where's none of them? <laughs> They're all dead and gone. Zero. <laughs> Zero. This God was prophesied about. You'll see if you look in your center column, in your center notes in the Bible, I'm just going to read one verse and turn to another here. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with God us. Is. Right. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. That was written by Isaiah in the Old Testament. It's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And if you turn over to Matthew, you'll see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's a really a miracle. And it should give us a pattern as to how we ought to be, too. You know, people miss this sometimes. We're called to be servants. That's what we're called to be. It's easy to get sidetracked off that. But really, that's what Christians are. We are servants, not just to God, but they're a fellow man. That's what we're called to be. Jesus laid this, he laid the foundation for that. He gave us the best example. If you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. It's written there, You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that, he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. The God who created trees chose to die on one. The God who created flesh and blood, knowing its weaknesses, chose willingly to take it on. He poured himself out for you and me. And it had to be this way. If you read on to chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those through fear of death were all in, life, in their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels. That's pretty fascinating does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You know, about five years ago, I was riding the bus after youth, youth group, with a little girl. She was from down in Brazil. And she was a cradle Catholic. She had been born in Catholicism. And maybe you've heard me say this before, but it's very applicable right here. I asked her about Catholicism. She immediately got defensive. I wasn't even trying to, you know, run her down or anything. She just got defensive. And she said, what I like about Catholicism is I'm a woman, and that's the best religion for women. I said, How's that the best religion for women? She said, because it's the only one that says that we can pray to a woman and a woman understands us better than a man could. That broke my heart because they believe they can pray to Mary, of course. And I was like, 
How can any mortal understand you better than Jesus Christ? Here's a God who created you, knitted you in your mother's womb, has every hair on your head numbered. He is the creator God. He spoke stars into existence. And he has your name. He knows your name. How on earth could anybody ever who has lived on this earth know you better than him? Matter of fact, he's the kind of God that is not so separate from us that he did not share in our sufferings. He did not bear the weight of temptation. You know, I mean, he bared the weight of temptation. He done all of those things. And you know what? I don't even think he had to. I think he would have understood us just fine without doing that. But he did it. He did it, didn't he? He didn't have to do it. We are recipients of God who chose to take on his creation for his creation. We just happen to be benefactors of it. It's kind of a, like I said, how do you communicate this idea? I don't know. There's no illustration I could do. There's no PowerPoint presentation to help you. I mean, it's a spiritual thing. There's a rest in my heart tonight knowing that our Creator was made into our likeness and died for us. What a wonderful thing to be able to appreciate. He understands our humanity. All of us understand humanity. He's so separate, they don't, you don't get it at all. Assuming he's real. <laughs> you know, he's not. So there's no other God like that. You know, the sad thing, to be honest, that the majority of people in this world, they will worship the creation instead of the creator. Well, and that's something that brings up a good thing. Something I forgot about that you said that, Fred, but you know. You'll never find anywhere, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, because I've not looked this up myself, and David. Uh, but I've heard it said, anyway, secondhand, that there's never been a missionary yet that's went to a foreign country. You went to a tribe, or went to somewhere, or found a group of people anywhere that didn't believe in some sort of God. Not yet. They've not found an atheist tribe anywhere. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that amazing? Mm. One of our professors say all the time, man is incurably religious. Mm. Even atheists are very, very religious about things. Right. I've known enough to know. They're very religious about things. Whether it be music or whether it be science or whether it be something. And I would weigh you down if I started just talking off the top of my head about evolution in and of itself. It's really more of a religion, more of a belief system than it is a science. It has to be. Because nobody's ever observed evolution. It takes a certain amount of faith to believe in that theory, really. It takes a certain amount of faith. And there's really far more evidence for Christianity than there is evolution. But, you know, that's an aside. What should this mean for us, though? In conclusion, I just say this. Taking you to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. So here we have a God, as you're turning there, as a quick reminder, who said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be a sun, and there was a sun. He made the stars. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He created all things. And the Holy Spirit says to us, even today, let this mind be in you. Chapter 4 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And there's a therefore after that. What should we do with therefores? Find out what the therefore, right? 
My beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, how much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. To tie this in with our sermon from last week, you know, God created the water. God created light. He created energy. He created fire. And one of these days, he'll destroy this earth by fire. Because he is a creator, he's also a destroyer. <coughs> he can do that. It's his creation. He can do what he wants to do. But he's already promised us that. And you know it's going to come to pass. And, and really, if you turn the news on anymore, you see prophecies coming to life. Mm -hmm. And it's happening. Mm -hmm. Our days are numbered here. And we ought to be thinking about this God of all creation, just how fast He is in all that He has done for us. And we ought to ask ourselves, what are we doing with Him? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Scripture says. Humbly live out our life. Humbly live out our life. Praise the Lord. 33 of the earth. Song for the life.
even in a fallen system, how glorious it still is, marred by sin. We really can't wait to see what heaven's going to be like. We can't wait to see what it's going to be like up there, Lord, without sin having any, any place in that heavenly way. And we're just so thankful, Lord Jesus, to know that you come to dwell and take on flesh and dwell amongst us, Lord, to redeem us from all sin. There's nothing beyond what you can do, Lord. When we look at your creation and see the mighty works that you have done, let it encourage your prayer life. Let it encourage the things that we ask for you, from you, Lord. Lord, just help us, we pray, to believe you for big things this season. As we come upon a new year, Lord Jesus, keep us away from New Year's resolutions. But let us be resolved to follow the Lord and believe you, Lord, for the things, the biggest needs in our community to be met by your grace and by your power. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for the, the kids out here and the ministry that they've got tonight, Lord. We just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you bless us in that way. And we just ask and pray that you would just go before us now as we go back out, Lord. Help us to be soul winners in this day, in this time in which you've placed us. Believe in a big God for big things who cares about the smallest parts of Israel. Thank you.